Okay, I'm going to do two poets in this uh, video. I'm going to do Ezra Pound and Wallace Stevens. So Wallace Stevens, first of all, was actually born right in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, if you go down on South 5th Street, I don't remember the exact number. You can look it up, but there's actually a little plaque on the house he was born in. So that's kind of cool, right? <laughs> One of the major players of the American modernist movement was born in Reading, Pennsylvania, but he only lived there for a bit when he was a child. Um, as an adult, he was actually an insurance man. He, he lived in uh, Connecticut and sold insurance, um, which, you know, insurance and poetry don't always seem to go hand in hand. But um, William Carlos Williams, who's the next poet we're going to do, is actually a doctor. So, and all people from all walks of life wrote poetry. Um, Wallace Stevens also spent a lot of time in Cuba and Key West and was really influenced by um, those cultures as well, which we can see a little bit in uh, his poem. So let's let's do that. Let's look at his poem and then we'll talk about Ezra Pound, crazy freaking Ezra Pound. Um, so The Emperor of Ice Cream was a tough poem. If you read this poem five times and we're still like, I have no idea what I read. I totally am with you on that. That's a, it's a really tough poem. Um, so let's take a look at it. I'm going to, I'm going to put a link of Wallace Stevens reading his poem for you so you can actually hear him read the poem. Um, but essentially there's two stanzas here and there's some sort of scene being set, but it's a little hard to figure out what it is. There's this, the speaker in the poem is kind of giving orders. There's this voice who's like, get this guy, get that guy, make this, do that. Um, he's like, call the guy who makes the cigars, um, you know, take the dresser, like get this. So we're not quite sure who this speaker is, but the speaker is somebody who is, is sort of telling everybody what to do. Um, so I'll try to just fill you in. I'll try to explain what I know about the poem from studying the poem and, and you can still go back and, and let yourself, um, you know, interpret it. If you interpret it differently, I'd like to hear how you interpret it. There's lots of really like just lush words in this poem and images, even if you don't know what they mean, big fat cigars and ice cream and flowers and cups, even that word concupiscence, like crazy words. Uh, embroidered, horny feet, um, emperor, you know, just the words themselves are really, I don't know, delicious. Like you can almost like sink your teeth into these words. Um, so, you know, even if you really just are like, I don't know what this poem means, but once you read it out loud, you can just appreciate some of the language and the playfulness and how Stephen sort of is delighted in using words and images that are so precise and, and crisp and whatever else they may be. So there is, um, you know, saying, get in the kitchen. We need cigars. Uh, we need ice cream. Uh, we need the boys to bring flowers and newspapers. Um, the scene is, is actually a, a, a wake. Um, in the next stanza, you see the body. It's an old woman. Um, take from the dresser of deal, lacking the three glass knobs. So she wasn't a wealthy woman you know her her furniture isn't great her feet were horny meaning like warty and like kind of gnarly toes and things like that um but we're covering her face so an old woman in the neighborhood has died and in in cultures like in key west and havana it was the tradition for the neighbors to come in to bring flowers because people would come to see the body of the deceased in the home um, and it would start to get stinky in, in the hot, moist climate. So people literally would bring flowers into the house to kind of mask the smell. Um, and then other neighbors would come and bring food. Uh, and, and ice cream was a really big treat back in the day. This poem was written in 1923 when not, most people didn't have freezers in their home. Um, again, think hot, humid climates. Um, you couldn't just go to the grocery store and, and bring home a, a quart of ice cream and, and go home and eat it. It was, it was a delicious luxurious treat um, so they were making these special treats for the wake um, so the idea of the ice cream is really indulgent and special um, it's not you know you have to kind of put yourself in that mindset the big fat cigars the flowers you know they're trying to make this a special occasion um, for the, for this wake which was you know strangely enough kind of festive people come to the house and celebrate the person's life um, the language is very sensuous, um, you know, cover up her feet to show how cold she is and dumb. So the ice cream, like the old woman, is cold. So you can see that he's like 
drawing parallels between these two scenes. The scene in the kitchen where they're getting everything ready, the scene in the bedroom where the old woman has died. Um, the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. And we don't know like who the emperor, who is the emperor. It almost seems like the speaker in this poem is the emperor because he's the bossy guy who's telling everybody what to do. You know, he's this like supreme ruler. But the idea of the ice cream and the idea of the old dead woman and the fact that if people, as the neighbors come, first of all, you have to, you have to get this over with quickly because even with the flowers, it's all going to start to stink. Everything is hot. You got to eat the ice cream now or it's going to melt because it's hot. So there's kind of this parallel between the ice cream and the old woman and the flowers and life itself. Like you've got to dig in, you know, you got to eat that ice cream before it melts. You got to live before you die, before your feet are cold. Um, before, you got to have the celebration before, um, you know, the, the scent of the flowers fades. So there's sort of this idea of like the ephemeral nature of life and, and um, but it's contrasted with, really dense imagery because the modernists were really big on the image in fact there were uh, there was a, like i said there's this branch of modernism where the poets called themselves imagists um ezra pound's poem is a really good example of that and there were three rules to be an imagist which you know rules poetry but i had to write them down because i always forget one is direct treatment of the thing so don't um, use abstractions, don't beat around the bush necessarily, treat the thing directly. No unnecessary words, nothing flowery or superfluous or overly descriptive, just very precise language. And then the music of the poem should be the music of melody, not the music of a metronome. So these songs do I'm sorry, these poems don't need to have meter or rhyme pattern or, you know, da -da 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 -da, that kind of rhythm but they should be musical and and lyrical and so you can see that in this poem he wants to, to maybe maybe talk about death maybe talk about the um ephemeral nature of life and things like that um but those are abstract ideas so by pulling it into these images of cigars and bowls of ice cream and cold feet and um you know dense rich imagery um that is like the modernist at work here uh, so let's hear what you thought about it. Like I said, it's a confusing poem, It's but it's dense and rich with imagery. And, and maybe, you know, after hearing a little bit more about it, um, things will start to come to you and it'll start to make a little more sense. So the Ezra Pound poem, um, Ezra Pound is kind of like one of the forerunners of American modernism. Um, he was friends and connected with all of these other poets and, and um excuse me, kind of an asshole. <laughs> he really was kind of an asshole. He was like a fascist. He, um, you know, his political views were deplorable. Um, I believe he served some time in prison for his, his political views. Um, just again, not like a good person, but definitely like a game changer in the world of poetry. So, you know, I don't know, you just have to take all that with a grain of salt. Uh, most of his poetry is super difficult, like super difficult. Like his masterpiece was this long, long set of poems called the Cantos. And I, if you guys want to read the Cantos and tell me what they mean, I would appreciate that because I have no freaking idea what the Cantos mean. They're so dense with like allusions to everything. They're so hard. But the poem we're going to look at is so simple and beautiful. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that makes you go, okay, Ezra Pound did he was a genius in his own way. Um, what, just one little bit from the Cantos that I'll read to you. And again, look, this is just like, again, a little excerpt from the Cantos, and it's just impossible. But um, what he says is, teaching, prayed on the mountain, and wrote, make it new on his bathtub. Day by day, make it new. And that was his thing. He really wanted a new type of literature, um, and he, he worked really hard at that. Um, so let's take a look at this little poem in the station of the metro. It almost looks like a haiku. It's not quite a haiku. You know, haiku is three lines. Um, this is even shorter than that. But um, it is um, 
it almost seems like haiku not just because of its briefness but even its subject matter haikus are often about nature and, and you know really simple images like that um and so the title at first you're like um the title it's so interesting to put the title with the poem itself so if you just heard in a station of the metro you know you picture a subway station and again you know this was the 19 maybe 20s when this poem was written i'm not sure i don't have it right here but you know, it wasn't as dirty and stinky perhaps, but you know, a subway station with tile and, and trains and crowded with people. But then the poem itself is just these two super simple lines. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. So it's faces in a crowded subway station being compared to maybe white petals on a slick you know, slick with rainwater tree branch. So simple, so concrete, except there's that word, the apparition. Apparition is like, you know, a, a, it's something you imagine, you know, like a ghostly, um, and, and you can imagine that, you know, from a distance and it's dark, it, people's faces aren't clear, you know, you just sort of make out um, facial features, but not crisply, you know what I'm saying? Again, I ramble sometimes, but, those faces are just kind of apparitions. They're not like individual faces with, from a distance. But that word apparition is so like, it is like a petal, you know, it's, it's, it's filmy, I think. Um, it's an interesting word. And it's obviously, you know, not as concrete as the, the black rain, I'm sorry, the, the black rain soaked branch or the white petals or even the faces or the crowd with all of the, you know, how that evokes your um, senses. But um, it's so, it's just beautiful. It's quiet. It's a really quiet poem. And the subway station is not a quiet place. But you can almost imagine it, like, with the sound turned down, you know, or, like, slow motion, like, that kind of, just, like, not actual sound, just kind of, like, the hushing noises of, of the trains going by or the people's voices, but not distinct, like, again, their voices being sort of an apparition. Um, it's, it's an imagistic poem, you know, it, it treats the subject directly. There's certainly no unnecessary fluffy words in this poem. And it, it goes with the, you know, it's musical and lyrical and liltful instead of, um, you know, rhythmic in the sense of a metronome. Um, just a beautiful, simple little poem. Okay, one more video to make and I'll be right back with that one. <laughs> 